All right, I'm going to go ahead and get started with a prayer. In the name of the Father, Son, Holy Ghost, Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Amen. In the name of the Father, Son, Holy Ghost. All right, thanks, guys. Oh, I'll go ahead and answer the question. So the icon behind me, because if not, I'm going to totally forget. It's actually uh, Father Emil Capon, who was a military chaplain from Kansas. I don't know if I have anybody else familiar with him. Um, he is our family patron. So he is right now um, um, in early stages. Um, so not a saint, but our family firmly believes that he is. We got to attend his funeral um, his official funeral the other year, you know, his story, it's absolutely amazing where they finally identified, um, his remains from, uh, the Korean war, um, just two years ago, um, which was really special to us because we already had a great devotion to him. So anyway, <laughs> don't want to go too off track because I could talk about him all day too. Um, but that's our family patron. Um, and he helped us. We firmly believe with the adoption of our daughter. Uh, so really strong devotion to him. Well, I'm here to talk about, um, what really matters as a homeschooler. And Walter, I thank you for that great introduction and giving me this opportunity to speak to everyone tonight. Um, I'm gonna try to keep my hands out of the frame as much as possible. But if you've ever seen me like talk in person, my hands move a lot, but we're gonna, we're gonna work on that. Um, but as Walter said, I also have four kiddos and my kiddos are, my youngest is three, my oldest is 12 and we're getting ready to run into birthday season here in the next couple of months where they all change their ages. Um, so I'll be really confused here in next month starting when their, their birthdays all switch. So right now I've had experience homeschooling, you know, all the way through middle school. Um, can't say I've homeschooled the high schoolers yet, um, but worked with a lot. Um, in addition, um, with the academic uh, stuff that I do for Homeschool Connections and for my university, um, I do specialize in child and adolescent development. And within that, I've always been an academic motivation specialist. And more recently, I've got into um, specializing with research on homeschoolers, on parenting. And if you've heard other talks I've given, a lot of times I talk about self-regulation as something that as parents, we really need to cultivate in our children. Also, by the way, my stuff fits really well because Philip Campbell was saying some of this stuff in his talk. Um, um, Jamie was saying some in hers too, so I'm kind of excited it all is going to blend together. Walter did a great job picking us all with our talks that all merge together, and I'm sure Jenny's is going to tie in after this as well. But I want you to think about homeschooling, right? When you're homeschooling, I always joke that homeschoolers get really uptight about the academic parts because people are always asking us, like, you know, what are you doing? How are you actually homeschooling your children? What's going on? What do you mean you get homeschool done in two hours a day? You know, public school kids are there all day. How are you getting this done? What are you doing? How are your kids learning everything? And I think we get kind of defensive sometimes about that academic aspect, right? And trying to defend ourselves to other people. So we focus on that, but a lot of times what we really need and what's really important isn't just that academic side, okay? So think about your goals as a parent, and you can put those up in the chat too. I have my chat over here so I can see, but if I had to ask you your ultimate goal as a parent, what is your ultimate goal for your children? What is it? because I have some ideas about what I think you're gonna put in there, if anybody's actually there, <laughs> you know, or you're just watching on your phone. Okay, getting to heaven, love of learning, oh, sainthood, oh, okay, yeah. I'm gonna let a couple other people just pop in real quick because I like proving my point that I, I'm right with, with what you're saying for my children to love Jesus, yeah, right? Put Jesus first, become like Christ, fulfilling their God-given vocation. Yeah, yeah. Hey, none of you said you wanted a straight A student. None of you said that. Getting to heaven, hopefully, yeah. I would argue that as devout Catholics, your goal as a parent is to get your children to heaven, right? I would argue that's what most of you are trying to do. And I think sometimes we lose sight of that goal, right? Because we're so wrapped up in that day-to-day things. Once again, I think this goes so well with what Jamie was talking about, right? We get wrapped up sometimes in those little things that we're dealing with, and we kind of lose picture, lose sight of that big goal of what we're trying to do, right? And along with that, other things I think we think about for our children ahead of academics are things like, I want my child to be a good person. I want my child to be successful. I want my child to be self-sufficient, 
right? So as we're at this mid-year review, um, you guys already joked a little bit earlier about for some of you, you're still in dreary February. Well, those of us in warmer places like me in Florida, I mean, it's, it's still a little drearier than normal, but you know, my weather's still pretty good, right? You know, we're doing our mid-year review with our kids and we're thinking, you know, where are we at? Um, in my household, I'm like going through one of my children and I'm like, wait a second, we're on week 23 or less, excuse me, not week, less than 23 for math out of 120. How do we, what, uh, how did this happen? Well, <laughs> why are we on less than 23 instead of more like less than 70 or so, right? <laughs> Having that kind of like mid-year, like, uh-oh, hmm. And, you know, depending on your kiddo, depending what happened in your life, you know, for us, it was more like for that kiddo, we had to go back and do some reteaching of some things that, you know, I thought we had a solid foundation on and we didn't. So, you know, we did what we needed to do. We went back and we fixed it. And so we're only on lesson 23, right? So we do this where we're looking like, where are we at? What are we doing? What are our goals? How are we moving forward? But what I want to challenge you to do as a parent, right? A little bit different perspective. So your academics are important, right? Generally, to be successful, your children do need a base level, you know, of academics to make it through this world. They have to be able to read. They have to be able to write. We have to have basic math skills. Depending what their career goals are, they might need, you know, more advanced sciences or advanced math. Like, we know that. So I'm not discounting that your academics in your homeschool are important because they are. But I want you to kind of think about are you getting those goals of helping your child be a better person, helping your child be a saint? Are you focusing on those as much as you're focusing on the academics? A lot of times parents think that those things kind of come naturally, right? Because you probably don't remember someone teaching you about virtues and character. And maybe you did. Maybe you were lucky and you had some of that. But a lot of times we ignore those aspects and just go into the academics, assuming our children are somehow going to pick up those skills along the way. And some of them do um, a little bit. You know, some just naturally get a little bit better as our brain power improves as we age. So some things get better. But I'm going to argue to you that without a lot of practice and research supports this too, we don't make it to our full potential. I can tell you this as a college professor all the time. Probably I use this in about every talk that I give. When I have students in my college classes, and I'm a little scared to say that I've been teaching college almost 20 years. Uh, but so all this experience, all the, you know, at this point, probably thousands of students I've had go through my classes. I very rarely, if ever, see one who didn't have academic preparation enough to at least pass. Maybe not be a straight A student, but they have it enough to be able to get through. They fail the classes because they're not capable of turning the assignments in, figuring out what they need to do or how they need to do it. So we're not focusing on some of these skills that they need. Yeah, those kids can read and write, but somewhere along the line, they missed, right? The more basic skill of you probably should turn your homework in, right? You probably need to do that. So we want to think about as parents how we can build those skills in our children. Because it doesn't matter if you're the smartest person in the room if you don't turn your homework in. You could be the smartest person in the world and still fail my intro to psychology class, right? So we want to focus on that. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to pick a psychology theory, um, a very popular one called self-determination theory. Okay, um, not going to go into too much of it, but I'm happy to provide links for people if they want to see after, you know, if they want actual links to the articles to show that I know what I'm talking about. But uh, this is probably one of the most, if not the most dominant human motivation theory in motivation and psychology and some other fields as well for about the last 20 years. It really came out around the year 2000. Um, and there's been so much research on it. It is still popular today. People are using it in all different kinds of fields. And there's a lot to this theory. They talk about intrinsic motivation and extrinsic motivation and different things. But I'm going to focus on one simple part that you're going to be able to remember. A part of this theory says that we as human beings have three main needs. And when these three, and they're psychological needs, obviously we have needs to eat and drink water, things like that. But we have three main psychological needs. And when we have these three needs met, we tend to be more happy, healthy, and successful people. So what I want to pose to you as parents is for you to think about these three needs and think about, are you actually meeting them? 
or what could you be doing, you know, to be meeting them more for your children, to help them grow into the people that you want, to help them become the saints that you want them to become, okay? So the three uh, needs that DC and Ryan in self-determination theory say we have are autonomy, competence, and relatedness. So those are our three needs. And I'm gonna go through each one individually and give you guys some examples of each one. So I'll start with autonomy. So it's probably something you've heard of before and you may or may not know the exact definition, but basically autonomy is being self-governing, right? So this idea that I make my own decisions, I'm in control, I'm the one who decided this. And I think everyone probably listening in in this talk can agree that you do like to have autonomy, right? That something is human beings, right? God gave us free will and we like to use it, right? For our own decisions, right? So think about your career, if you have a career or your vocation in general, right? Aren't you happier if you believe that you chose that direction for yourself or you chose to work at that job versus you had to do it because there were no other options? So we know that kids who feel this level of autonomy are just like adults, that when we feel like we made the decision, we had a part of it, it's what we wanted to do, we are way more likely to do it and be motivated to do it, right? Kind of common sense, right? When we really break it down and think about it. So let's start sort of with how do we do this for our children? Because Obviously, we can't, you know, just give them full reign. That's not how it works. They're children. So this is one of the ones especially that's developmentally appropriate. So what autonomy looks like for your kindergartner is different than what it looks like for the fifth grader versus the 10th grader, right? It's going to look different as you go through different ages and stages. So for your little kids, it's often things as simple as giving them choices in their day. So after dinner, you can either do dishes or you can sweep the floor. What do you wanna do? And of course, we're winning as parents. It's a great parenting trick. Both options are things we want them to do, but the child picks the option so they feel a lot better about it. Not that it works every time, but once again, think about how much better it is to choose it versus being told that's the thing you're gonna do. And I bet some of you even have those kids that when you do do that, you tell them no matter what, even if that child would have picked that, they're still going to throw a fit at you, right? Some personality types like really, like really need the autonomy to feel like they could do it. So we have to think about, you know, are we giving our kids choices as are developmentally appropriate, right? Now, of course, don't overwhelm them, um, but give them that. There's great research looking at five-year-olds playing with the parents. And so their parents, you know, sitting down to play toys with them. And they found that when parents let the children lead the play, so the parents let the child have the autonomy. So the child's like, oh, and the magical unicorn jumped over the moon. And then we went and got a pizza. And then we ate with the Ninja Turtles. And then they saw Peppa Pig and blah, blah, blah. And the parent just kind of goes with it. Versus the parent who was like, um, wait, that, that doesn't make sense. You're crossing storylines. You can't, can't do that. The unicorn is not going to be with the turtles, like, right? When the parents directed the play more with the little kids, the little kids stopped liking it. They didn't really want to play with the parents anymore, right? The parents were a buzzkill. <laughs> And the, the kids lost the autonomy and they didn't want to do it anymore. So think about those things. And I certainly, there are times we need to direct our children's behavior. You're not always going to be able to give them a choice. If my child is running wild through a parking lot. I need to grab my child and stop them. That's not a time where we have the choice. Like, do you want to run through the parking lot? No, it's not how that works, right? So it, it has to be kind of kept in check with their levels. Um, and I will also tell you, there's some good stuff with this too, showing that when they look at kids in elementary school years and middle school years, the kids that were actually more successful, meaning they did better in school overall. Sorry, all the research is focuses on kids in school, guys. I take offense to that too, but that, that's how it is. But kids did better than in school. Kids were happier. Um, kids were more self-regulated when they were in homes that were considered structured. So the parents had rules and structure in place. So those kids were able to kind of function better because they're a little bit young, some of them, to have too much autonomy. So one of my parenting mistakes that I sometimes have is some days it's a little more chaotic than structured in my household. 
And I can tell you on those days, especially if I'm putting in a lot of hours for me, um, my household kind of disintegrates and I walk out of my office and I see children swinging from rafters and different things. And it's just not pretty. Well, that's because the autonomy I put in that situation was not appropriate. They needed more structure. They needed more boundaries. So you want to think about that for your individual child too. So it's not just giving them total control. But as they get a little bit bigger, giving them more control becomes more important. Okay, so think about as you're getting to mid-elementary, you're moving through that into like the middle school years. Your kids should start to have more control over some of the aspects of their life. So for example, you're still picking what subjects you're covering in school or what classes they're taking, but maybe you're offering them the opportunity to pick how they want to do it, the order they want to do it, when they want to do their work, right? So you're giving them some options with that so they feel like they're a part of it. Um, along with that too, especially on the smaller, you want to give some information and some feedback and some suggestions. That's good. So you might say, well, you decided to do your math last, but actually, you know, math is one of your most stressful subjects. And if you do it first in the morning, I'm going to be able to sit down with you and we can focus on math together. So do you think it might be a better idea to do math first? And your child may or may not buy into that. Um, and I, if they didn't buy into it, I'd probably let them, you know, do <laughs> the math at the end of the day, even though as the parent, I know it's not going to be good. But learning from their mistakes is so important. And I'm going to hit on that again when I talk about the older kids, right? They're starting to kind of learn, take in information, plan out like, okay, here's what I have to do. How am I going to do it? How do I want to do it? Right. And once again, you give them a little bit more control. You're going to increase that motivation within that. OK, by the time they're moving up into the late middle school, high school, most kids should probably be doing the majority, maybe not all of it, depending on your child, but the majority of their planning for the week. Now, of course, you as the parent are probably helping them plan out like, oh, we need these courses on your transcript. So we make sure you graduate. So it's not like you're once again giving them total control. So you may be setting up the schedule over the summer. You got to take this course and that one. But then you're giving your child those opportunities to set it up. Like, OK, when am I going to do the work for this? If this class meets on Monday and the homework's due on Sunday, you know, how am I going to fit this if I usually do youth group Sunday evening? They need to learn that. Once again, that goes back to the college students. When the college students are flunking out of my classes, unfortunately, what I see, it's not the college students who have families or who have jobs that they're working. These kids are usually between 18 and 21 and are only going to college. Maybe they have a work study job, but that's it. And they can't get it together enough to do this, which is really sad right? When we think about it in the scheme of it, you know, you can tell that they never had those opportunities um, or they were never in an environment that they were used to dealing with all the stressors, you know, that come with college, whatever it was, I would argue they probably weren't set up with the skills that they needed to be successful. Okay. So as we go and we get older, we want our kids to have those skills. So they start to figure it out. And the other aspect I'll say to that too, is the importance of failure with autonomy. Um, they need to have opportunities to fail. Now, as parents, we hate that. Uh, we want to swoop in and save our children. That is our natural parent thing. We want to swoop in. We want to save them. I don't want to let you fail. I'm more embarrassed actually when you fail than if I fail, right, as a parent. But those lessons will stay with them. So I can think of my personal example. Um, I was like 14. And so I'll go off the tangent because I think it works better when you have an example. But I was 14. I was actually really good at Taekwondo. I know it's so surprising probably when you're looking at me, but like I was really good um, at like kata or forms, whatever you, you call it. I was super good. Uh, and so I was going to a local tournament and I was like, oh, I got this. I'm really good. I don't need to prep for this. I'm ready. Ha -ha. So I go to this tournament. I look terrible and people like placed ahead of me that like in a normal thing, like it was nothing. And the embarrassment and shame and I, that I felt from that experience was awful. It was bad. Bad to the fact that I still remember it to this day. But so that wasn't fun. But the lesson I learned 
do you think I showed up at any other tournaments after that or any like things like that without preparation? I did not because I remembered how it made me feel and much better that I learned that lesson at 14 than I learn it later in life, right? As a college student, when I fell out of a class and then I wasted lots of money or whatever the situation is, or at my first job, you know, where then I lose my job. So we want them to have those opportunities to make those mistakes while they're still with their parents, while you guys can still swoop in after it's done and say, okay, that was terrible. I'm sorry. You know, you can comfort them. You can kind of talk them through it, you know, explain those things. So keep that in mind. So if you have a situation where the best way probably to say it is if your child deserves to fail. I'm not saying situations where you set them up for failure because that can happen sometimes too. Like the kid is in too challenging of a course or something like that. I'm not saying that that would be best in that situation, but something like that where maybe they entered in the science fair and they don't, you know, start the project for the science fair until like the night before. And then they're asking you for help with it. Probably best in that situation to say, nope, I reminded you, I told you, this is yours to deal with because the lesson for them is going to stay with them versus if you save them, they've learned nothing and will probably be more likely to do it again. Okay, my last point on autonomy. So I talked about how we want to feel control, but the other opposite side of that, especially in our world, is being able to be in control but not go out of control. And once again, I think this is something that's great to learn um, while they're still at home. So you're giving them these opportunities. Our culture is very, do what you feel, do what feels good, do these things. Oh, you have to do this. Like we're a very hedonistic culture. And I feel like it's only getting more hedonistic as we go through. And once again, I see this in college students, they get out into the real world. And some of them, you can see that the parents, you know, while well-meaning, didn't necessarily give them the opportunities to kind of understand, you know, how to stay away from all the temptations, how to make good choices. So part of just giving them control is also helping them learn to moderate that a little bit so that when they do get out into the world, they're able to manage it. Okay. So that's autonomy. Okay. Second, competence, the need to feel com competent. I'm going to keep saying it right, competent, right? So we want to feel like we can be successful, okay? Or we're confident in our abilities, right? So competence is I feel successful. Uh, there's this challenge coming up, but I believe that I am competent enough to be successful. Sometimes competence is a narrow definition. Like you may think about your competence in like a particular subject. Sometimes competence is more of a broad thing. Like, okay, I believe I'm capable of succeeding because in the past, I know I've been able to work hard and get through adversity. And if I keep trying at this, you know, I'll be able to succeed. And once again, we want our kids to have that kind of ability to be like, all right, I think I can rise to this challenge. I can do this. And so the question is, how do we build this? Well, as parents, a lot of this is how we respond to and how we talk with and how we praise our children, right? Now, for some of our kids, we have kids that this is really easy for. You probably have children super easy for. And then you probably have children that this is super hard to do when you're trying to think about their competence. What are they competent at? Because a lot of times we think about the common skills, right? Like academics. So if you have a child that excels at academics, they probably receive a lot of praise for that in different ways. Uh, so a lot of times it's focusing on the child um, and they don't necessarily have to be bad at academics, but we want to think about, are we giving all our kids like that level of competence? Am I catching the child who is often the one doing something bad? Am I actually catching them then when they're doing something good? I'm sure you've heard that before as a parent, catch them doing something good. Because as parents, we are naturally looking for those negative things, right? I'm seeing like, wait, wait, oh no, don't do that, right? Versus good job, right? We're probably way more giving negative feedback than we are giving that positive feedback. So we want to think about if you have a child that you know you're not giving positive feedback to, I want you to think about that child and what positive feedback you can give them, okay? Because there's always positive feedback. I Your child is doing something right, right? Sometimes it's, 
I really appreciate your persistence. You are so persistent that one day, if you want to, you will conquer the world. Because remember, parents, stubbornness in children becomes persistence in adults if it's managed correctly, right? So sometimes it's that, but a lot of times there are other skills. So my child who, you know, isn't necessarily as successful at academics, that child's social emotional intelligence is through the roof. I've never seen a child be able to wander up to just anybody the way that child does and just, you know, talk to them and make them feel good. Um, I have neighbors coming over and be like, you know, that child is amazing. And I'm like, really? Because that that's not how it is with the siblings in our house. But I'm so glad that I've apparently done something right that when the child goes out into the world, they're very helpful. Um, they offer to help the neighbors. It's actually, I'm very proud as a parent. And so sometimes I forget you know, while I'm praising like the traditional good things that I need to make sure that child's getting the praise too. And I'm saying, hey, you know, I am so proud that you are being such a nice person. You offered to help the neighbor, you know, carry the packages in, whatever it is. So catch the children being good. The other thing too, don't take for granted your children who are always good. That's the other thing I can tell you as a parent, sometimes I forget to do. I have one child um, who just generally excels at everything. I don't remind this child, this child just does, like it, it looks really good. And what I often forget to do because that child is good a lot of the time, I don't always tell that child how appreciative I am or how proud I am of what that child's doing. So on both ends of it, we tend to fall into those you know, spectrums. So think about that. Like, how are you building up your children? Like, and are you promoting the skills that you want? So if we want them to get to heaven, are we praising them on the skills, the virtues that they need, right? So if you want them to be humble, you want them to be generous, we want to try to focus on competence for those skills, right? So think about that. Are they being something that you want them to do? Wow, you were very humble today and gracious um, when that person talked to you after church, um, after your solo, or, or whatever it is, you know, focus on those skills. Um, so we want to make sure that they're, you know, feeling that. And keep in mind, too, some of the traps that we fall into as parents. So a great example is maybe your kid that is a little bit more difficult. They had a great day. They did their schoolwork without complaining. You didn't have to remind them to do chores. I mean, they crushed it for their, you know, their behavior that day. And then at nighttime, they forgot to do their bedtime chores. So they didn't get their pajamas on. They didn't straighten the room. They didn't brush their teeth. So how do we approach that child at the end of the day? Well, you have two main options. You can go in there and go, hey, you didn't brush your teeth. What are you doing? Go brush your teeth. You know you're supposed to do that. Okay, so how's my child who probably tried really hard that day feeling now? Are they feeling encouraged or are they feeling discouraged? So they're feeling very discouraged, right? Because they did all those good things. But what did I tell them about? I told them about the one bad thing that one bad thing, right? Or if I go in and I go, hey, I just want to tell you, you crushed it today. This is the first day you did all your schoolwork without me reminding you and you helped with chores without complaining. Now, you forgot to brush your teeth and we need to do that. But I'm so proud of you for what you did today. How's that child feel? Is that child now more motivated, believes you have faith in them now that they can succeed? Or are they feeling crushed, right? We want those kids to feel that. And also parents, don't forget, sometimes you need a do-over. Because I know I have moments when like, you know, it feels like the house is burning down, kids are going different directions, I'm trying to answer an email, and I have that first option, right? The why didn't you do this? What's wrong with you? And then I realize that if you can, you really should go back and say, hey, I wanted to tell you, I, you did, you did forget your teeth brushing, but you really did good the rest of the day. And I am sorry that I did not point out what you did good. So I want you to know I'm really proud of what you did. Yeah, you still need to do the night stuff, but I'm proud of the rest of the day. And I imagine that's going to change how that child feels pretty quick. So think about that too as parents. How are we building their competence that they feel that they can succeed? Am I focusing on those skills that they need and that I want them to have to be a better person? And finally, the last one I'm going to talk about is relatedness. So relatedness is our close relationships with others. And obviously, I'm going to focus on our relationship between us and our children in this one. So I think in a lot of ways, this one comes naturally because we're parents, 
right? Like we sort of think that we don't need to focus on this because there are children. But I bet when you think about your relationships with your kids, you probably have some kids that this is easier than others. I know I do. So sometimes it's about thinking which children I need to cultivate the relationship with, right? Or how to do that. One of the biggest issues though, I think once again, this is a cultural thing. I think our culture throws at us and I think it's the devil at work trying to destroy the family is we live in a culture of a lot of busyness. Busy, 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 busy. I'm not even sure sometimes how public school parents do it because not only do they send their children to school, then they also go home and do all these activities. But even as a homeschooler, I feel this where I'm like, oh, my kid needs to do this activity, this activity, we need to join just co-op. And before you know it, you're running in like 50 different directions and you're not really having any of that time to connect. So that's probably one of the main things I would say is don't fall into that trap of busyness because it firmly is a trap. That's not to say your kids can't do stuff. My kids do extracurriculars, but think about the time and what you're spending. Or if you are doing things, can you build those relationships? So maybe you have a long commute, right? Can I have those conversations on the commute, right? You know, so it's not to say if your kiddo excels at something, I mean, we spend a lot of time at music lessons, um, but I try to keep that as our only like year long commitment for the kids, right? Other than other things that we kind of need. My littlest one actually, or not my littlest, my five-year-old recently got to join gymnastics, but she doesn't know it's only because gymnastics was offered at the same time as piano lessons in the same plaza. If it was not, I would not have put the five-year-old in gymnastics. So I'm really hoping they don't change times anytime soon because it's going to be rough. But I was like, okay, value add for all of us, not taking away from the family thing other than I need to be there 15 minutes early. We're already there for piano lessons. Gives the five-year-old something to do during piano lessons. It's great. So don't fall into that busyness trap. So much great research out there on families that eat dinner together, at least, I think it's four, at least four nights a week, have better adjusted children. Now, I'm sure it's not the eating dinner together. I'm sure it probably relates to the fact that those parents have better relationships with their children because they're getting to talk to them, right? They're having those opportunities. So they're sitting down. So whatever your mealtime routine is, if at all possible, try to have one. Do something where you're going around the table. Uh, my husband's really good at this, where he's like, everybody, I want you to tell me about your day. And we start with the littlest one and we go around. And my little ones, man, I get some great stories from the three and five-year-olds about their day. And I'm like, um, I think we did that. But okay, you know, all right, we're going through. We're learning how we do all that. And then usually that opens up into more conversation. Make time for your kids too, especially when they want to have that time. I am not great at this. My husband, so good at this. But a lot of times, like think about your day. Your little kid comes up and says, will you read me this book? But you're in the middle of doing something else. Now, I know it's not always possible to say yes in those situations, but I encourage you to say yes more than you say no, if at all possible. My husband is so good at just dropping whatever he's doing and going and playing Candyland for the hundredth time. Right. And a lot of times in those situations, it's not large amounts of time. Like sometimes we forget. We're like, I do not have time to read you this book. But in reality, reading that book probably would have taken like five minutes. And even if they ask you to read another one and you say, oh, I have to go back, you still made that commitment to them. So think about those things. So when your kids are actually asking for that time, try to give it to them. Right. And when your big kids, as we're changing, like I said, I've got an adolescent in the house now. Uh, it's different. I understand I'm talking about adolescence and Philip's talk at, before this. It's a different world with adolescents. So think about how you can connect with them, right? What are things they like to talk about? I know for one of my children, that child wants to talk to me about fish all the time. And I am not interested in talking about fish, but I got to kind of suck it up and listen to what this child wants to tell me they learned about fish today. And, you know, building those relationships. Um, adolescents, they, they mentioned too, like some kids like, like to do their work late at night. Well, it is because their circadian rhythms are different. Their melatonin production and their brains happens later. That's why your adolescents naturally become night owls and want to sleep in, right? My adolescent wants to have those talks late at night. <laughs> And I'm like, I'm so tired, but I try to make sure even if I can't do it every night that, you know, at least some nights I stay up a little bit later than I would if 
she wants to have this conversation. And I sit down and I listen because we got to build these relationships now. If you don't build these relationships now, they're not going to be there when you grow up. You're not going to easily build relationships like this once your kids are out of the house. So you as the parent, if you want to help, you know, be the guide, be the person that they talk to, you know, that they ask questions to, these relationships are so important to build now. And then, like I said, from the motivation perspective, when they have those relationships, when they know you're safe, when they know they can talk to you about anything, even if they screw up, that they can talk to you, then they feel loved and secure. And if they feel loved and secure, like that's going to be reciprocal, then they're going to tell you, you know, the thing that happened or the thing they were embarrassed about doing that they shouldn't have done. Like they're going to tell you those things. Okay. Keep in mind how you respond. You know, you don't want to break the trust. I mean, yeah, sometimes the kid needs some type of consequence for whatever happened, but make sure, you know, you're keeping that line open. Like, you know, I am so glad you felt, you know, comfortable enough to tell me that Um, we're going to figure out what we can do to move forward. You know, we can't be doing that, whatever, whatever the situation is. Right. So we want to make sure we're building that. So as a parent, keep those things in mind. Right. So academics are important. But sit down a little bit and think about, okay, am I meeting their autonomy needs? Do my kids have any sense of control or is everything dictated? You know, do my kids feel competent? Do they feel like they can succeed? Do they have a strong relationship with me? Do they feel comfortable? Can they ask me the things that they want to ask me? And so in the big picture, these are the kind of things that we're building in our little humans so that they go out and be amazing humans and hopefully become saints. So thank you guys. That was great, Christy. Thank you so much. Wonderful. Round of applause, everybody. <laughs> you can see the pauses coming in and the hearts and all those emoticons that are just a flurry. I like how they kind of float too. Yeah. <laughs> Well, you know, and, Dr. And so, Dr. Moore, I'm sorry. There was a question. Would we be able to have that answered? Is that okay? Yeah, of oh, course. Yeah. That's what we have time for. Yeah, this is. Uh, yeah, sorry, awesome. Kathy, we didn't prime yet, but we're going to have a, a little <laughs> Q and A here at this at this point in the time uh, or at this point in the conversation. So, uh, thank you for bringing that up. By the way, um, so yeah, so Rachel asked, uh, should we allow them to choose what order to do their work when we want them to make certain subjects are seen as more important, and we need to get get done as a priority. Sometimes not everything gets done. <laughs> yes. Yeah. And that's a hard one because you're right. I know in our house, it's like my one child is never going to choose to do the language arts and the writing, but that's what that child needs to do the most. So there is balance sometimes. I firmly agree with that. I would say you try to figure out a way that you do give them some control over like the priority of it, right? So depending on what the subject is, maybe you talk out about like, okay, well, maybe on these days we do this first, sort of see what they want. So one of the things I've done with, you know, like I said, one of my children who's just avoiding language arts stuff and reading as much as they can (laughs) is focusing on books that that child wants to read as much as I want them to read classic literature. And I do put some of that in there. I try to give them as much choice so then I'm not fighting the battles. So even though Diary of a Wimpy Kid, not good literature, not bad necessarily either, depending yeah. on your amount of crash humor that you like. It's as not going to win any kind of uh, Pulitzer yeah. yeah. or anything. Yeah, exactly. But that child loves those books and reads all of them and will read them over and over and over again. So I'm like, okay, child is reading. We're going to take that as the win. We're going to go with it. So think about within that, what are something you could give control to? And sometimes it's telling the child too, you have to learn to write. (laughs) We were doing that this year too. You have to learn to write with proper punctuation and grammar. Okay. You will have to do this no matter what. And then the child was like, well, but you have spell check. And I'm like, okay, yes, (laughs) but you have to learn to do that because there will be times where you actually have to write something down on paper. I promise. So yeah, sometimes it's just saying that like you have to have this skill. Like, sorry, this is a non-negotiable skill. You have to have it. You need it to be successful. And then sometimes you can go into great examples of why some kids care about that. Other kids are like, whatever, but yeah, it's that balance between the two. And we don't always have spell check. It's not always yeah. available. And spell check is always is not 100% either. So 
Yes, it, yes. It, it, it can make mistakes as well. So we got to know, you know. Um, all right, so Rachel asked a question. Uh, a benefit to homeschool is flexibility, but the kids, but then kids feel slightly unlet, slighted, excuse me, slighted, unless they're treated exactly the same as siblings. How to keep them from feeling, quote, unfair when I treat them individually? Oh, that's a good one. Mm, yes, yeah. something else I deal with in my household. So <laughs> I try to focus on the kid and their individual strength. <laughs> yeah, so we get that where like, that child doesn't have to do writing. And I'm like, that child actually already finished their writing curriculum for the year. And that's why. <laughs> right? So sometimes it's just those answers. I focus on here are the strengths that you need to work on. Here are the weaknesses. Like sometimes it's kind of individually talking about the child and saying, you know, your sibling, this is your sibling strength. Sometimes it's helpful to point out sibling weaknesses. So if you, once again, you have the sibling that's struggling more, you know, they're just not academically, you know, it doesn't pick it up as easy for them. Sometimes what I do is I point out the other sibling's weakness in some ways. Like, yes, you have to put more effort into this than this sibling, but you can go, you know, do these other things that your sibling can't do. That's where your strengths are. So God gave us different strengths. You kind of want to play that, but try to emphasize that you're doing it to help them. And, you know, when you're trying to do the other stuff to help the sibling, right? And of course, keep in mind if you are being fair, you know, within that in the different loads, but usually the parents are being fair. I think it's just, it's perceived as unfair um, between the siblings. Yeah, I, I, that's a great response. And Erica asked, um, my four-year-old has uh, started to be sneaky when she does anything she knows we don't approve of and we'll even lie about having it done or having done it, excuse me. How do you suggest we handle these situations? So first of all, that is super normal. Most little kids at that age go through that phase. It's actually a big leap in cognitive development that they understand how to be sneaky and how to lie. So I know as parents, we don't perceive that as positive. It actually means they have the ability to think about how others are perceiving what they're doing. Okay, they actually mm. call it theory of mind is what the official term. So your child knows it's wrong. And then if they you see them or they know you did it right. And of course, at this age, it's usually very simplistic because they're still really bad liars. So that's your <laughs> advantage. They're bad liars. But they've yeah. cognitively got to that point. So a lot of it's testing the skill versus doing something bad. They're kind of like testing that skill and seeing. So it's a big emphasis on, OK, this isn't what we do. It's wrong to lie. And once again, a four-year-old, you're only going to have so much, you know, explanation. They're just not there where you can have a deep conversation about these things. So I would just keep over and over, talk about, you know, this isn't what we do. It's wrong to lie to mommy and daddy. Um, you know, depending on your child, you might bring that back to Jesus doesn't, you know, like it when we do this. Um, you know, some kids that can be a little too guilt trippy. So, you know, think about your individual child and, and where they are with that. But they will most likely grow out of this stage just naturally. Just keep emphasizing we don't do that. And maybe sometimes there's a direct consequence for the thing. Like, oh, you took the cookie and then you lied about taking the cookie. So now you don't get any cookies tonight or, or something very, once again, very simple relating to what they did wrong to try to kind of push that message home. But it's probably something they'll grow out of easily. That's great. Yeah. It's great to have a good teacher and a psychologist all wrapped up into one. So uh, this is, and you're a homeschooler. So that's even makes it even better. So, um, yeah, I, I don't see any other questions, but you know, clearly uh, the, the, the conversation, uh, what people have expressed has an appreciation for this point of view. So thank you again for your time. I, I do want to pause here for a moment. Does anyone have any, Oh, sorry. I'm not trying to share my screen. Um, I thought I clicked on it. All right, Sue, Sue had her hand raised. Excuse yeah, me. Sue raised her hand. We're not going to take questions over the audio bridge, however. Um, so, Sue, if you have a question, if you could just type it in the chat, that'd be great, and we'll get sure we'll be sure to answer it. Um, but if anyone has any other questions, feel free to um, feel free to go ahead and uh, ask it in chat. We'll stick around here a little bit. Uh, let's see. I'm not seeing anything come in, or you can even ask it in the Q and A panel. Either way, it doesn't matter. I don't see anything coming in yet. You know, it is kind of challenging. All these kind of developmental issues. Okay, well, here we go. Patricia, I, I was going to ask a question, but here we go. Patricia asked, any advice 
Let me go back to that. <laughs> Sorry, I just dis disappeared on me. Um, yeah, any advice on grade nine girl who wants to go to public school, public high school? I like and how it's self-directed to public. Angle? Yeah, let me make sure, <laughs> Patricia, any particular angle you're looking for? Uh, are you talking about she wants to go, but you wanted her to stay home? Or what? what's the, maybe could you clarify? And she's an only child, I guess. Or, yeah, yeah child. Okay, that's what's split. <laughs> we get I appreciate it. you typing yeah. fast. I totally get that. Yeah, same, yeah. I had the same thing. Yeah. So yeah. my first thought on this is why? What has she told you? Like, why does she want to go to public school? So that's what I would focus on. What is her why? So you're saying only child. I'm guessing more social activities. That, that's my guess. That's, yeah, make friends. That's usually what they want at this age. So if you are, and I'm not here to judge anybody's choices. Obviously, I think we're probably all homeschoolers. So I'm not here to judge people's choices of what, what they do with their children. Um, if your goal is to keep her homeschooling, and I guess that that is what it is, um, I would focus on, are there other things that serve that making friend purpose in the homeschool world? So I don't know, are you doing any co-ops, any other type of activities? Because that is what I would tell you. Um, my children have made amazing friends from co-ops, oh, three co-ops. So she just hasn't really connected with anybody in the co-op. I mean, great. she's in co-ops. So yeah. you're trying it, you're doing all the stuff. So Part of it depends. So you're the parent. I guess the question I would ask you right now, besides the why does she want to do this? Can we remedy the problem is, are you actually going to let her go to public or whatever school? That would be the question, because whether you say yes or no to that probably is, is going to depend how you want to handle it. Right. Because if you know there is no way you are letting her go and you're the parent and that's your decision. Right. Then. I wouldn't entertain the idea. Like, don't kind of run it around to her with that. Okay. Uh, okay, so she's not seeing her friends too much. So I, I would kind of go at it that way. It's so hard because I know they get to this age, they want to break out. And that need for independence is so, once again, natural. Adolescents are going through that. That's what we're primed to do because we're getting ready to leave our parents eventually, right? And go out into the world and seek our vocation. That's what we're supposed to do. So that naturally want to break up. They want more friends. My daughter told me this week that she doesn't like going to Bush Gardens with me anymore. And I was very, very <laughs> sad. I was like, oh no, we're at that age. No. So, ways you can get her those social needs met that she has. Like, do you think there are ways? Like, I, I would focus on trying to do that, trying to figure out, can I get her together with her friends? Can I meet these needs? It's just so hard. Like, I, I, I sympathize because in that situation, I know parents deal with it a lot. Um, you know, you're fighting that. She wants this. You know what's best for her probably at this age still. Like, you realize, like, the risk. I mean, and maybe you can portray it, too, as do you realize you'll be there all day? Um, I had one child that sometimes will threaten, you know, I could just go back to school. And I'm like, oh, do you want to get up at 630 in the morning? Do you want to be there by 750? Mm -hmm. Do you want to walk every day to school and do all your homework once you get home after three o'clock? And then that child's like, oh, that's right. I forget. So maybe it's also talking to her about what it really looks like, because I'm sure she has this like, you know, perfect vision of what high school looks like to her, right? Uh, in that situation, it's going to be awesome. You know, everybody's going to be nice. Oh, yeah. Oh, Patricia, that's so hard. Because <laughs> they are at that age. Uh, and you've probably done such a good job, like taking care of her, keeping her in a good peer group, um, then that she probably doesn't even understand like what's out there. So see if you can focus on, do you, I mean, have you had that? Do you really want to go to school? Do you really want to spend that many hours a day in all these different classes? Like I might kind of go that route too. Once again, you're trying to keep that autonomy. We really want her to come to the right decision. Um, but ultimately you're still the parent and you get to make that decision. But I'd be looking at ways if I could increase the social aspect because sometimes parents bump around too. Like I know high school is a big transition time for parents. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of you know, like the co-op you were doing might not have high school or it might not be working for your family. So maybe it's like looking at different co-ops. Maybe it's looking at homeschool connection, student cafe. I know a lot of students connect that way because they maybe don't have a lot of homeschoolers, you know, that have similar values to them in their area. 
So those would be what I would be trying to do. That would be my best advice. Yeah, it's a pretty tricky situation. Let, let's take one more question and then we'll uh, we'll draw this one to a close because we got to transition to our next talk. By the way, great great stuff. By the way, and it sounds like she's in a really pretty a big a bit of a pickle. But uh, um, yeah, great 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 suggestions. So Joanne asks, um, do you recommend any executive functioning skills kids with high functioning autism should work on, especially? So this, so I am not a specialist in neuro um, diverse kids. So I don't want to ever say that I'm a specialist because it's not what I'm trained in. I probably know more than the average person, but that's the limit of like where my neurodiverse stuff is. I think it really depends a lot on your individual child and what skills they have and what skills they need to succeed. And you as the parent probably know that best. You know, when they're in groups, when they're in different environments, what's the what are the big biggest problems? Like, are there things that are always occurring with that child that you think you need to focus on? So I would think it's probably a very individual answer to your child versus like it's always this one thing. And unfortunately, like I said, I don't want to talk too much about it because I'm not uh, a specialist within that area. Yeah, it's a it's a it's a that's a good question and um, a tough response. I mean, tough situation, but um mm -hmm. But yeah, good stuff. Really good stuff. And so we are, let's call this one to a close. Let's draw this particular talk to a close since we are uh, right upon the top of the hour. And we got to get ready for Ginny Bales, mm -hmm. who's already with us. So uh, we're glad to have her with us. So uh, Dr. Moore, thank you very much for coming. Thank you. We really appreciate it. Uh, I think everyone else appreciates your comments and your advice and your insights. Uh, yeah, you can see the hands Bye. clapping and whatnot. I'll stick my email in the chat. You're welcome to email me. I'm probably not going to answer you tonight because I'm going to just go chill after listening to Jenny's yeah. talk. So I will probably answer you on Monday. <laughs> That's great. That's great. Yeah. Thank you very much for offering that, by the way. And it is nice to know that we have these people that have presented that are still willing to extend their expertise and their knowledge beyond the actual conference, which is kind of cool. And by the way, if, this is what, this is a, an inkling of what, the Catholic homeschool conference is like in June. So if you want to know what that's like, this is just a sample. Uh, and so if you have, I, I plug it because it's so good and it's got so many cool aspects to it that allow you to collaborate and connect and that sort of thing and, and share these, these same, these common difficulty struggles and whatnot. It, it's a great way to, to kind of get all that in one, in one location. So very good. And yeah, thank you for including your uh, your email in there. So yeah, if you have any, oh wait, um, I think you sent it to just the panelists and the host. Do you want that to go to everyone else? Yeah, can you send that to everybody? Sorry. Thank sure, you yeah, no you. problem. No <laughs> problem. Let's make sure that that's going to the rest. There you go. Yeah, There's your email address. So yeah, feel free to reach out to Dr. Moore and she'll uh, she'll get back to you on Monday. <laughs> <laughs> Probably Monday. <laughs> yeah, you go crash. Thank you very much, Dr. Moore. We really appreciate it. Let's go ahead now and take uh, another five minutes